temples and grand historic buildings that we're justly proud of and celebrated for the world over. What you may not know is that it's estimated that since 1900, over 1,200 notable buildings have been lost forever, and over 5,000 buildings are currently at risk if no one intervenes to save them. Is it impossible to keep them all? And which ones really deserve saving from the ravages of time and neglect? For a thousand years, castles have dominated the landscape and everything around them. I'm Dan Snow, and together we're going to explore the sites of some of the greatest sieges of the Middle Ages. The very moment when the fates of empires hung on castle walls. This is Battle Castle. Fierce staff, please welcome Dan Snow! <laughs> series, book to accompany it, 500 years of night and siege warfare, just the kind of thing I'd expect you to do with it. But, but the worry is, is the fact that these places are disappearing. I mean, we can't save them all, though, can we? During the course of uh, writing this book and making this print, we visited so many castles of a dilapidated state. Of course, they look so strong and powerful, but actually, the weeds get in there. You know better than anybody. Yeah. And it can just rip that stone apart and rip the masonry apart. So it's, it's, uh, they're very poignant places, and sometimes very sad to visit them because we're losing them. But what's the solution, then? I mean, never the monkey just isn't available to you know, keep them all going. For 5,000 at risk, each of them costing X millions, where's the money from? Well, it's, it's very hard in, in days when there's no manifest schools and hospitals to justify yeah. this. But the fact is, these buildings are the representation of our past. And without a past, you don't really have a future. They're, they're a very important place where history is made. But also, there's an economic, there is a strong economic argument. These are unique in the world. If people see these buildings like some of the ones behind you now, they can only be in Britain. That's what Pete Taurus is going to come in the future. It's actually a strong economic argument. And they're beautiful to go to them. And there's a huge quality of life issue around these parks and castles and gardens as well. And you've chosen castles particularly. I mean, that's obviously your thing. It's kind of battlefield in the So it's, so it's the, the castles, the really medieval battles and whatnot. Are they in a more powerful state than the steady hands of where the castles are? Because they're old well, I mean, I suppose the good thing about castles is it, it, all the lots of the windows and the roofs. People don't realise, but castles had extraordinary paintings on the walls, often murals. They were often whitewashed and wo roofs wooden. They've all pretty much gone now, but very few have been kept. So in a way, what you're seeing now in castles are kind of skeletal outlines on them. Some of these buildings, the small, so later buildings, are desperately trying to preserve really the fabric, the materials, the textiles, the wood in those buildings as well. So it is harder. We need them. And to explain further, from the organisation Save. Rhiannon Wicks. Rhiannon. Yeah. So, what can SAVE do? What is SAVE trying to do? Well, SAVE's a campaign group which has been going since 1975. And we've got buildings at risk register with over 1,400 buildings on it. It's all right putting them on a register so we know yeah. whether there's something else to worry about. Well, we're very much about action. Right. And we're an independent group, so we've got no government funding, so we can speak out loudly for the historic environment as we wish to do so. So what do you try and do? Persuade individuals to take them on? Is that one of the ways around it? Well, sometimes we'll take on buildings ourselves, but because of our size, we can only take on a few at a time, or one, really. Um, but we'll try and raise awareness, um, we'll try and engage local people, so campaign groups, local civic societies, um, to really make a difference to in their local people sort of forced into yeah, action. They can pay their own way, can't they? Because people actually want to live. You know, the, yeah. the, the value of properties in historic areas, heritage areas, is actually higher than elsewhere, so they can be made to pay their own yeah. Give us some examples. We've got one, Winstanley. Winstanley Hall, oh, yeah. outside Wigan, which is yeah. a wonderful Elizabethan house, um, which was actually going to be demolished. And SAVE came in at the 11th hour. It was November, and the committee were deciding that a couple of weeks later. And we said, you absolutely cannot demolish this. This is a wonderful building that can be reused for the future. Yeah. And we're now working with English Heritage and the owner of the building to enact a rescue package. And we're currently fundraising, actually, so it's great to talk about now, it. The building behind them, this one's in Liverpool. This, yes. is, this is Littlewoods. Yes, building. it is. Yeah. And what's the interest in that? Because that's much more modern, obviously. Yeah, so 1938 was an iconic Art Deco building, an Art Deco palace in the style of the ones on the Great West Road in London. Really, some publicity for Littlewoods, football pools. And, I mean, that has a real memory for people in Liverpool. Any interest in that so far? Yes. I mean, Liverpool people are absolutely passionate about it. And this is actually owned by the Homes and Communities Agency now, so it's publicly owned. So, really, we should all be taking interest in these buildings. And once they're gone, they're gone forever. There are success stories coming, then, 
there are success stories. There's, there's been amazing projects. We've all seen them up and down the country of old mills being turned into the most incredible accommodation. I mean, these people want to live in a historic building. And as you say, this is given Liverpool its character. If you rip down this, what does Liverpool have under its incredible parts? The Lido building. There yes, you go. They would say. Example. But what if you own a historic building? Joining me now are the owner of Cotton Manor and the lady who will one day inherit it and all its responsibilities and problems, Mary Ann Robb and her daughter, Charlie Campbell. <laughs> this, this is yours, Mary Ann. How long have you owned it? 20 years. So you're quite recent incumbents then. Absolutely, what yes. Made, what, I was going to say, what possessed you? It's, it's, it's beautiful. But what made you feel you wanted to take it on? Well, it was just so marvellous. When I first went there, I thought, here, let me live and you, die. You fell in love? Yes. Did you really? Yes. Charlie, the prospect of you taking this on, what kind of feelings does it imbue you with? How do you uh, feel about it? I sometimes um, feel, my goodness, Am I going to be able to follow in my parents' footsteps? Yeah. But actually, it's it's a tremendous place. It's a wonderful place for my children to grow up. It's but a great responsibility. A the huge upkeep of this. I mean, down there, you know, this must have been an astonishing building to, to, to keep the roof on, to keep the water out, apart from anything else. Yeah. Yes, it is. But it, the first drop is the most important to catch. Yeah. <laughs> and is, is that the main thing, to keep your water tight? The most important? Well, just general maintenance. Yeah. As soon as anything goes wrong, it has to be seen to. Well, I, I don't want to be personal about it, but can you afford it? I mean, it, it must drain your drives enormous. It, it does indeed. So, you know, if you, if you live above the shop, you're always working. Yeah, yeah, we need more people who are prepared to take responsibility. These guys are amazing. Keep it, and they're being very modest because this is an absolutely stunning house in the heart of Somerset with the most incredible interiors, collections, uh, wooden panelling from different periods of the house. I mean, it is, this is a kind of classic jewel of, of Britain built from all these different periods, encapsulating our very diverse history. You've got one big um, concern at the moment, and that is these wall paintings inside. Tell us about those. Well, the house is in pretty good order, other than the wall paintings. And the wall paintings date from the 15th century, and they were expected to last the lifetime of the person who painted them. So probably. you've kept them going quite well, then, well, if they're still we there. Well, but they're yeah. beginning to fall off the walls, and they need stabilising, and they need probably £10,000 for each painting, ten to £20,000 to, to and, and clean how, them. How many paintings have you got? I think there are about six. Yeah, so that's a lot of money. Charlie, you're happy to take this on. You're looking, will you, pleasure is, will you make any changes? Um, actually, no, I don't think so. You just want um, to keep it we, it we, we take people around the house now, and actually we get withdrawal symptoms at the end of our garden season. Because we, um, people take such pleasure in visiting the house and gardens. So sharing it with others. Yeah, it's absolutely. It goes back to your thing of people loving it. Exactly. They're not just things to look at, things to experience, and, and they improve the quality of life for everyone who visits them. Well, we wish you luck with it. Uh, and if you've got a few, Bob, it's ten to twenty thousand pounds per painting in the six. Okay. <laughs> Bye, thanks. To Ellen Wicks, Mary Ann Robb, Charlie Campbell, Dan Snow, and the wonderful book and series, Battle Castles. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.